I'm Savannah Levins with 11 Alive Investigates. In the last year, more than 650 reports of stopped trains on railroads have been reported right here in Georgia. Federal railroad data shows that more than half lasted multiple hours or even days, and these problems aren't just an inconvenience. In an emergency, it could be the difference between life and death. The small town feel, its charm, the town of Juliet, Georgia is synonymous with fried green tomatoes. Before the movie, it was my dad's antique store. And the tracks outside the Whistle Stop Cafe. I hear a train. For locals like Andrea Goolsby, its charm is lost. It's slowing down. With the sound of squealing brakes. How often is it happening that a train's stopping here? Four out of seven days a week. For hours. Hours. It was near these tracks where an impaired driver recently crashed into a 73-year-old woman. The stopped train blocking the ambulance's access to her. The only way around, a 35-minute drive. They put her on a stretcher and pushed her under the train. And it's not just a small town problem. 911, where is your emergency? This is another route for this train because it's been on the track about an hour. Hundreds of reports are pouring in every month from residents in Fulton, Gwinnett, Clayton, and beyond. People are crawling under the track, trying to go through it, and we got people in wheelchairs. In Lithonia. It's been a big nightmare because it sits on the train track for weeks at a time. The stop train is a constant reminder to Charlotte Owens. Yeah. Of the day it almost cost her her life. I was actually having a heart attack, and the ambulance could not get to me. It was terrifying. One of the medical people had been to my house before, and he got out and walked up to me. I could have died. It's a challenge, and we recognize it, and we're aware of it. Now. DeKalb Fire Chief Darnell Fulham says the county has nearly 200 crossings to navigate. When the crews are responding to calls, uh, first of all, they know where they're located, and, and I can tell you that they're looking for the trains. In Cobb County, it's also top of mind for first responders. We practice and train for those type of situations. But neighbors say their complaints to train companies and lawmakers have fallen on deaf ears. If they had to sit here at this train for hours every day to make it to the Capitol, it would be different. A spokesperson for Norfolk Southern, one of the two major railroad companies in Georgia, tells us it tries its best to avoid blocking crossings, saying trains can stop for many reasons, from crew breaks to maintenance issues. But for Andrea, those explanations feel like excuses. It's not a good excuse when it happens multiple days in a row at the same time every day. It's kind of hard to believe. 37 states have laws limiting how long trains can sit on the tracks, but Georgia isn't one of them. Why do you think that is? Control, money, power. I think there needs to be legislation and they need to be held accountable. We reached out to both CSX and Norfolk Southern. Both companies say they have put plans in place to address this issue. A spokesperson for CSX says it offers 24 seven access to current train location and crossing information that first responders can access when they're responding to an emergency. A representative for Norfolk Southern told me the company contributes funds directly to impacted communities and even helps them apply for infrastructure grants to fund solutions like overpasses. I also spoke with Rebecca Serna, executive director of Propel ATL, a nonprofit advocacy organization dedicated to pedestrian safety. Here's what she had to say. The railroad tracks are a big part of the problem. It's also the streets adjacent to the railroad tracks because when the railroad is blocking that one crossing that you need to use, you have to go around to the end of a long, long line of rail cars. And so for us, that would mean going a half a mile one direction or three quarters of a mile in the other direction on a very dangerous street, Lee Street. Um, and so making that tough calculation, um, particularly as a parent, when you're with your kid and we were on a bike or on foot, um, what, what's my least worst option? Yeah, I think you touch on a really good point because I think a lot of people will look at this story and be like, so what, you have to go an extra half a mile this way or that. Um, but not everyone is in vehicles all the time. Not, not everyone has that access. Can you speak to that a little bit and why this can be a life or death thing? Exactly. Um, there are so many households in Atlanta that don't have access to a car in their entire household. And at the time that we lived here, we didn't have a car. So we were exclusively riding Marta, walking or biking. Um, and a lot of families are in that situation. And we live in a city. It should be 
relatively easy or at least possible to get around safely outside of a car. You shouldn't have to have a car for your transportation needs. Um, but situations like this make it really challenging. There have been reports of trains stopped across intersections for not only hours, but days, weeks, even months at a time. Does that surprise you to hear? And like, what do you think is contributing to this happening? Unfortunately, it does not surprise me because that was my experience as well. And um, I really can't speak to what's the, contributing to making this happen, only that um, it's really gonna take a concerted effort, I think by all the neighborhoods that are affected by it, as well as our elected officials and all of our city leaders to make a change here because it's not just one neighborhood, it's not just one crossing, it's really more of a pervasive problem that we're seeing across the city. The adjacent intersections need to be improved so that they're not unsafe for people walking and biking and riding transit. So if you look at the uh, intersection on the other side of the West End Marta station, if you look at the next intersection down Lee Street where people are forced to go to cross, those intersections can be improved. Those are within the city's control. And so that's something we're advocating for, as well as transforming Lee Street itself. We have a long-standing proposal to convert a lane on Lee Street into a safe place for people to walk and bike. And the neighborhoods are very supportive. This is something we've been working on since 2014. It's funded. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a cyclist was killed biking on Lee Street earlier, um, late last year. And so really the time is now to make these changes that are within our control while we're working on this longer term problem. Yeah, I was surprised to learn that Georgia is one of the only states that does not have any laws or rules on the books for how long a train can stay parked especially given how many railways we have. I mean, does that surprise you? And how do you feel Georgia and Atlanta stack up as far as pedestrian friendliness? Well, Atlanta was a city built around the rail intersection, so it doesn't surprise me. That was really prioritized. And it remains a really important part of our economy. But at the same time, we have to be able to balance out some of those economic needs with other economic and human needs of people trying to get to work and to school and the grocery store. Atlanta still has a ways to go when it comes to being a place that's safe and welcoming to walk or use a wheelchair. Uh, we do an annual report on pedestrian fatalities and last year uh, pedestrian deaths increased 23% over the year before. That year was an increase as well. And so there's a disturbing trend. We're hoping 2023 turns out to have been better. And the city has adopted Vision Zero, which is the goal that no one dies or is seriously injured in traffic. So we are taking steps in the right direction, but we have a ways to go to catch up. Do you think pedestrians, people in wheelchairs, people who are primarily on foot in the city uh, tend to be overlooked sometimes when it comes to legislation, things like that? Absolutely. People tend to see what they know to look for. And so I think it's really important for elected officials to get around the city differently, experience what it's like to use a wheelchair or push a baby in a stroller or walk to work or ride a bike to get to the grocery store because until we have elected and appointed leaders that really understand that on a very intuitive level, it's just gonna be harder to design streets that prioritize the needs of pedestrians. In 2019, the Federal Railroad Administration established a blocked crossing incident reporter portal as a way for the public and law enforcement to report blocked crossings in response to a growing number of complaints. I spoke with FRA Administrator Amit Bose about how that data has impacted their approach to the problem. So FRA has uh, authorities in place to regulate the railroads. Now, they're specific in nature and uh, they depend on the situation. Some uh, authorities are things that Congress has given directly to the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, other uh, authorities are through regulations that FRA has uh, instituted. When it comes to block crossings, there is not a regulation uh, at the federal level on blocked crossings. If you could talk to me a little bit about the blocked crossing incident reporter that the FRA came out with in 2019. What was the inspiration behind launching that and what was the goal? Yes. So when it comes to the portal, it's something that FRA instituted back in 2019. And then Congress in the bipartisan infrastructure law made it into law, even though FRA already had it in place. But now it's in law for FRA to have this portal. And this portal uh, is a useful tool, uh, but it doesn't give us uh, enforcement authority. It doesn't give us uh, at the FRA the ability 
to fine uh, railroads if there's a situation where they're blocking crossings. Now, we've been talking about regulations and laws. What FRA also has the ability to do is use uh, some of the other tools that we have available. We have um, a whole a part of FRA, a whole office that is focused on grade crossing safety. And the, that office uh, works with uh, communities uh, throughout the country and railroad companies directly so that they can uh, address block crossings. We also use our grant programs so that if there's a block crossing where eliminating that block crossing by building an under pass or overpass uh, can help uh, the community, we have some grant uh, funding available for that. And also when it comes to uh, the, the tools that FRA has, um, I, I don't know if you're aware, but our FRA Grade Crossing and Trespass, uh, Trespasser Outreach Division conducted a focused inspection uh, in March of 2023 of grade crossings uh, throughout Georgia, where we looked at the grade crossings to make sure that they function safely, uh, those that are in place, and also um, to make the railroads uh, fix any uh, grade crossings that had any deficiencies. And, uh, and also in some cases, we work with uh, the local authority that may have responsibility uh, for that grade crossing signal uh, or grade crossing uh, bar. So this data through the block car crossing incident reporter has been very helpful for us, you know, as journalists to get a better perception of like where some of these trouble areas are. Is the goal to use some of that data in like this grant writing process as well? Is the goal for these rail companies to be able to use it to identify problem areas or like what or both? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's uh, one uh, reason we have it in place. Uh, what what FRA is doing with the data that we're uh, gathering from that portal, and, and we look at that portal on a regular basis, uh, it, it informs our data-driven uh, approach, and it helps us to partner with the railroads, the states, and local governments to identify mitigation measures in those communities that report a high number of block crossings to that uh, Great Crossing Incident Reporter. Now, one example that we have uh, directly is in the Houston area, uh, where we uh, really focused on a high number of reports that we were getting for a number. Um, it's been a perennial issue, but we captured those um, incidents through the portal, and, and we had a number due to that portal, and we were able to compare one calendar year uh, versus another. And so between July, August of 2022 to January and February of 2023, we had a 40% reduction in the reports of block crossings in Houston. Another area where we've done a lot of work on block crossings and an area that's really benefiting from a federal grant that we gave is in Birmingham. Uh, there's uh, a community in Birmingham that has experienced block crossings again for a number of years. So it wasn't it wasn't that this block crossing reporter shed light on that. We knew that for a number of years. But what FRA did was roll up our sleeves. We worked with Norfolk Southern and the community uh, to address uh, that uh, area in Birmingham. I wanted to ask about this $3.2 million that was allocated to Georgia specifically, I believe it was last year, um, and would love to hear about like the intended uses for some of those funds. I know we, we've talked generally, but do you know, Georgia specifically, what some of that money went to as far as projects and alleviating this issue? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, those, that grant program is made possible by President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law which provided $3 billion over five years for the railroad crossing elimination program. It also provided $5 billion for the consolidated rail uh, infrastructure and safety improvement program. We call that CRISI. And uh, so we are encouraging communities throughout the United States to apply for those grants. In Georgia, we were able to fund three grants uh, specifically in the Chatham County area, so in the Savannah area, 
then also um, a, a grant for Gwinnett County. And uh, when it comes to Gwinnett County, I had the chance to sit down with Congresswoman McBath uh, in Gwinnett County uh, directly to hear some concerns from Gwinnett County about perennial issues there. So this grant is going to help there. We also gave a multi-thousand um, dollar grant to DeKalb uh, County, to an area in DeKalb County that's experienced perennial issues. So in Georgia, uh, through this program, we were able to focus uh, and, and award grants in, in three uh, substantially populated areas. But we know that grade crossings not only affect uh, metro counties or, or urban counties, they also affect uh, non-urban uh, areas and rural areas. So uh, Secretary Buttigieg actually went uh, to Georgia to make an announcement um, back uh, last year for a grant that went to Millen uh, to help with a grade crossing there. So we do not want to overlook um, or we want to help as many uh, parts of Georgia as possible. That's great. And just, you know, to be a little more specific for people who are seeing millions of dollars go to something and they're not seeing immediate impacts. You know, when we're talking about going towards projects, are we talking about building overpasses or, you know, closing debt? Like, are there any specific projects that these are going to more often than not these funds? Yeah, Savannah, that's a really good question. And, and I know the public wants to know how the bipartisan law is uh, is helping them uh, with their projects. So these projects in many cases take a long time to put together. Uh, they require engineering, uh, design, uh, a lot of planning uh, goes into those projects, not to mention sometimes the projects require, uh, are required to go through an environmental process. Um, but, but with this five years of funding in place due to the bipartisan infrastructure law, we're seeing strong interest and we're seeing these projects that had languished uh, for a number of years of projects that, that people didn't even think would be possible to fund. Now through the bipartisan infrastructure law, we are able to fund them. And, and I can tell you uh, through the uh, uh, Railroad Crossing Elimination Program, we got over $2 billion of requests in funding for $570 million available and in the Chrissy program, we were also got way more applications for funding than the funding we had available. So we see the strong interest out there. And again, for local communities that have been dealing with this, not even in the recent past, not over the past few weeks, not over the past few months, but for years, uh, there are opportunities to seek that funding. But that also means working with the local government, means working with the state of Georgia, it means working with railroad companies like Norfolk Southern, which is not easy to do, but there is a path to do that. And, and that's where FRA can be helpful is to bring uh, citizens, communities, uh, railroad companies and, and local entities together to move forward a project. I'll continue to follow this issue. If you have a tip you'd like me to look into, email 11alivenewsinvestigates at investigates at 11alive.com.